Welcome back. The global securities markets are shifting. At least the global primary equity markets are to this part of the world. In the 90s, 80% of global IPOs were done in OECD countries. Now, that's down to 40%. In 2006, the value of emerging market IPOs was roughly equal to that of US-based IPOs. Now, US-based IPOs are down to half. This is but one big change facing securities regulators from across the world. The other is technology-driven innovation. So high-frequency trading, dark pools and whatnot. Well, I spoke to Greg Metcroft, the chairman of the board of IOSCO, that's the International Organization of Securities Commissions, about the challenges facing regulators post the global financial crisis. There's three key challenges we face uh, as global regulators. Uh, and it, and the challenges we face in terms of meeting what I consider to be our two key objectives, which is to make sure that investors can be confident and informed right. and that markets are fair, orderly and transparent. They're our key objectives collectively as regulators around the world in financial markets. So first of all, I think what we see is, is, com is structural change. Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, market-based financing, which is what we oversee, there is a definite trend of that growing around the world and there's a demand for it to, to grow. Uh, we're seeing with the banking regulation, the cost of, of banking uh, is, is rising with you know, higher capital charges and liquidity. We're also seeing uh, that there is that constant shift of, of movement of savings from the the banking sector into the pension fund sector uh, as emerging markets start to develop retirement saving systems for the, their populations. But equally we're seeing with demographic change as more people move into that uh, retirement phase in the developed world and even in, in the emerging markets more savings is moving into, uh, um, into the, saving, into the uh, pension fund system. And Basically, what they invest in is capital markets products a lot of the time. So that's the challenge, is that there is uh, a need to harness those savings. I think we've seen in the last 50 years that direct investments, especially in the developed world, have tapered off considerably. We've now seen it come down to between 10 and 25 percent, mm. if I was to broadly you know, band it. Are you saying that there could be a reversal of that and that we'll see direct investment in the market, that is investment not going through intermediaries such as mutual funds, in fact increase over the years to come? I think that uh, you know, there's going to be a lot more focus on uh, the efficiency of indirect or intermediate investment, which is you know, the, the fees that you pay for that intermediate investment. And you're certainly seeing that evidence by the growth of ETFs mm. in that they're purchased directly on the market uh, as a product, but they still have the, they have the benefit of being managed, but they're actually very low fees. So I think you'll continue to see the growth of, of ETFs because of the low fees. But again, they're execution product in the market. Right. I think the other aspect, I think you are going to probably see more direct investment, is that you know investors are becoming... Uh, more literate in terms of participating in markets. So you may have seen that trend uh, over a long time, but I, I think that you may see a, a reversing of that trend. We've certainly seen that in Australia, that um, the superannuation sector, a lot of it is moving more into self-managed funds from uh, um, basically institutionally organised funds. Hmm. If this is uh, an ageing population saving, then does that mean this has a lower risk profile and therefore how regulators look at the products that come to market to meet their investment requirements need to be regulated differently, let's say, from how they have been in the last 10 or 15 years? Well, uh, it's a good question. The self-managed super fund section in Australia is one which we consider to be of higher risk because they're managing their own money and they invest in capital markets products and therefore that is quite a challenge. But the approach to regulating, uh, if you want, the, uh, the capital markets products uh, is no different to what it has always been, is making sure that the you know, conduct and the disclosure is appropriate. But one of the things I think that more and more we're focusing on is the limitation of disclosure as a, an effective way of... Uh, of, of communicating risk um, 
And if you think about it, disclosure is just really a way of explaining the risks of a, of a, of a product. And one of the things that we're more and more focused on is behavioral economics, trying to understand how people make decisions mm -hmm. and thinking about new tools that, that product manufacturers can use to communicate risk. And I think that is the new aspect of how um, you know, we're thinking about how we regulate financial products is to make sure that at the end of the day, the investor understands you know, what they're buying. Uh, absolutely critical. It's been five years since the global financial crisis caused by CDO, CDS and other WMDs. Innovation may still be a four-letter word for most regulators. But markets, they have a mind of their own. For instance, by one estimate, high-frequency trading, a technology-driven innovation, constitutes 60% of U.S. trading volume. In Europe, HFT makes up for almost 40% of volume. Dark pools or off-exchange trading platforms used to execute large orders and suspected of distorting price discovery have now usurped more than 25% of U.S. trade. And ETFs come with mounting systemic risk. But I do want to ask, and I know I've been in the previous panel that we spoke about making mm. the case for innovation mm. and uh, for easier regulation, uh, but I have to ask, this innovation when it comes to high frequency <laughs> trading or dark pools or all the technology based innovation that we've seen take place in the last five or seven years, has that narrowed the market? Has it told retail investors this market is too sophisticated for you, uh, this is not the place for you to be, uh, has it scared away smaller companies that don't have the ability to deal with this? Is this innovation that is only benefiting institutional investors? Look, uh, you make a good point in that, you know, one of the problems with high frequency trading and dark pools, from an, a retail investor perspective, they're concerned about, you know, whether they're, when they're buying stocks in the market, whether they're actually getting a, a fair price. Uh, I think that is a, a genuine concern that's coming from investors. And equally, smaller companies, if they want to use uh, uh, a traded uh, stock as a way of raising capital, yet there's all this, uh, you know, the mystery of dark pools, high frequency trading, it's a disincentive. The, I guess the objective for us as regulators is to try and reassure both, if you want, the investor and the issuer that, you know, the, this new technology is the new norm and that, you know, in the case of, say, dark pools, that there is an appropriate regulatory framework there to make sure that the prices that they are getting are fair. No, I get that. Mm. I'm just wondering if you think, in your assessment mm. of how where global markets are headed, mm. whether the small guy is being left out because the market has now become so sophisticated. If 25% of U.S. trade is dark pools, if 60% of U.S. trade in volume is high frequency trading, mm. where's the place for the small guy in this? In India, we're the, focused the, the all the time on bringing the, the retail sorry, investor the, um, back. Should we the, give that up? That the, the small guy can still participate in the market. It's just that the volumes of trades that are occurring because of something, say, like high frequency trading, the actual, at the end of the day, the small guy is, is what most corporations want. They want, at the end of the day, they want real money investors. So we want the small guy. India, mourning the desertion by retail investors, is looking for innovative ways to bring them back. For instance, SEBI's proposed IPO price safety net mechanism is intended to give investors protection at a time when many primary issues have fared poorly on listing. The ISCO chairman would not comment on this much controversial protection measure, but he did say something rather interesting before the interview, that Australia has taken investor protection out of the regulatory conversation. I think that at the end of the day, markets, uh, when you invest in markets, you take a risk. So uh, that's the nature of markets. So uh, at the end of the day, trying to protect investors is very difficult. What we really, my mandate legislatively is not to protect investors, is to make sure they're confident and they're informed. That is my, that is my mandate. And informed is, is a very important part of, of that mandate. And being informed, our focus, our first thing we do in terms of achieving that mandate is our focus on education 
financial literacy. Uh, you know, we just trained 6,000 teachers in schools in Australia, and our objective is to have financial literacy taught from kindergarten to year 12 in the 10,000 schools in, in Australia. You know, providing uh, you know, educational tools to enable investors to understand what they're investing in is absolutely critical. So that's, that's an important part of what we do. And then the second thing we do, and that's the deal, is we hold gatekeepers to account. Well, that was an exclusive interview with Greg Metcroft, the chairman of the Irish School Board. With that, I'm going to wrap up this edition of The Firm. Remember to stay in touch. We'll be back next week. And join us as we celebrate five years of being on air. It's an amazing show and I see a great future for the show knowing the fact that India is becoming a more and more complex place to do business. The amazing ability of the show to go to the heart of the complex corporate law issue in a matter of few minutes and analyze it in a simple language with eminent guests makes it so interesting that I'm glued on to the firm week after week for the last five years.